Hey guys, I'm Fancy, and this is Murder by Design. Alrighty, well. Sorry, there we go. Hey, everyone. Oh, my grandson's starting to fuss. Give me one second. Little boy. Little boy. Here, put this back in your mouth, baby. Sorry, guys. I'm on grandson duty. Anyway, hey, alrighty. So. I'm sorry that we didn't do our live yesterday. I was a little under the weather. Uh, you know how I get when I've got fibromyalgia. So when our weather starts to change here, it's crazy horrible for me. So I barely got out of bed yesterday because we had a big storm coming in. But today it's beautiful outside. And so I'm feeling much better. Um, so lately we've talked a bit about genetic genealogy and how it's being used to solve cold cases. Some going as far back as 100 years. We had a great chat with David Middleman, the CEO of Author Inc., and we discussed the amazing strides that they're making in the field. If you haven't seen the video, check out the show notes. I put a link in it to it below. It's absolutely fascinating and kind of mind-blowing to see the advancements being made when you realize that none of this was even possible just 50 years ago. Simply put, uh, genetic genealogy is the use of DNA testing to determine relationships between individuals and find genetic matches. An example would be running DNA from the scene of a murder through a DNA database to find someone related to the murderer. When a match is made, the person's family tree can be used to pinpoint which of their relatives could be the murderer. I, recent told, I recently told you about the Michelle Martinko murder case, which was solved this way. DNA testing and genetic genealogy led to three brothers as possible suspects. Further DNA testing showed one of the brothers, Jerry Burns, to be a perfect match to the DNA from the scene of Martinko's murder, and the case was finally solved. More and more we hear about DNA advancements and cold cases being solved after decades. People who have seemingly gotten away with murder and other atrocities are finally being brought to justice and being made to answer for their crimes. In the cold case of, oh gosh, I don't even know how to say this, Shiban S-I-O-B-H-A-N, McGinnis, Othram Laboratories was recently able to come up with a DNA profile using the equivalent of about 50 human cells. That's a minuscule amount of DNA and a case that is almost 50 years old. But along with finding perpetrators of crimes, DNA testing has also helped to identify unknown victims and exonerate innocent people who have been wrongfully confused and con con accused and convicted of crimes. The other day, I talked about the toddler who was known only as Delta Dawn since 1982 when her body was found on a river bank in Mississippi. It was announced last week that she's finally been identified after all these years as 18-month-old Alicia Ann Heinrich. The late Attorney General Janet Reno once said, the use of forensic science as a tool in the search for truth allows justice to be done, not only by apprehending the guilty, but also by freeing the innocent. Hey, Ty, how are you this morning? This afternoon, I guess. In 1986, in England, Richard Buckland was a suspect in two cases where a teenage girl had been raped and murdered. He even confessed to killing one of the girls. DNA testing of evidence from the scenes of the crime excluded him and helped to identify the real killer of the teenagers. Just this year in California, Ricky Davis was freed after spending 15 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit. Genetic genealogy was used along with publicity or publicly available genealogy websites to put together a family tree which led authorities to the actual murderer and exonerated Davis. Hey, Christina, the Innocence Project represents people who want to use post-conviction DNA testing to prove their innocence. According to the Innocence Project, as of now, 375 people in the United States have been exonerated by DNA testing, and 21 of those people were serving their time on death row. Here are some facts from the Innocence Project about DNA exonerations in the United States. 
1989, the first DNA exoneration took place. 37 states were where exonerations have been won, 14 average number of years served, 26.6 average age at the time of wrongful conviction, 43 average age at exoneration, 44 of 375 pled guilty to crimes they did not commit, 69% involved eyewitness misidentification, 43% involved misapplication of forensic science, and 29% involved false confessions. Hold on one second. Let me grab this fuss bucket over here. What's going on? What do you need? You need this? You need a binky? Well, quit spitting it out, baby. There we go. Okay. Anyway, 49% of these false confessions were 21-year-olds or younger at the time of the arrest. 31% of the false confessors were 18 years old or younger at the time of arrest. And 9% of the false confessors had mental health or mental capacity issues known at trial. 17% involved informants. 190 DNA exonerations worked on by the Innocence Project. There is 130 of uh, 375 were wrongfully convicted of murders. 165 actual assailants have been identified. Those actual perpetrators went on to be convicted of 154 additional violent crimes, including 83 sexual assaults, 36 murders, and 35 other violent crimes while the innocent sat behind bars for their early offenses. Now, Along with all the excitement and hope that comes along with these advancements in DNA testing and genetic genealogy, there is some controversy. Some people think that the use of genetic genealogy is an invasion of privacy. Imagine the police knocking at your door and telling you that thanks to that kit you ordered to find out more about your ancestry and family history, they've discovered that you're second cousin to a rapist or a serial killer. It has to be quite unnerving and deeply disturbing. But I think that's something that I would want to be aware of. And if I had a cousin that's a rapist or a serial killer, I would happily turn them in. So either way, I'm okay with the possibility of my privacy being invaded for the greater good of saving someone's life or exonerating an innocent person. What do you think about the use of gene genetic genealogy? Do you think it's an invasion of privacy or do you support it 100%? Drop a comment below and let us know. I mean, I think it's a great thing, guys. I, I actually think this is, you know, a really, really great way to help solve these cases. You know, I, I agree, Ty. I do think that they have to now. Um, if they are booked, they have to submit DNA. Um, I think that's true. But um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, don't quote me on that. But I do believe that that's true, at least maybe at least state to state. I don't know. Um, but I know most of the time they do. Um so I think I think it's a good thing. I really do. I think this is helping solve um, many cases, and it's it's you know they are um, being able to save solve cases from a hundred years ago, guys, and cases from the fifties and sixties where you know they didn't have all these this technology, and and so it's really amazing. I'm really excited about this, and and our friend over at Authram, David, is um, just incredible. The work that he is doing is amazing, amazing. And we did an interview with him. Like I said, I dropped the link to it in the, the comments, but oh my God, I am in love with it. All right, guys. Well, that's my true crime tidbit for the day of uh, one day late. Sorry. Um, I am working to get out our second episode of Gone Cold. And remember that our bonus episodes um, on YouTube for our Scott Peterson uh, case is out. Uh, we're missing just Kirk Nermes and we're working on getting that one done. And the finale is up on madgingerentertainment.com or any of the most major podcast platforms. So you guys can go check it out. We finally finished it off. Um, I think the finale is really great. It's a little long, but I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. And then if you want to hear from Joseph Scott Morgan on the autopsy of Lacey and Connor or Dr. Robbie Ludwig, um, who is a psychological profiler who wrote a book about killer spouses. And she featured Scott Peterson as one of those killer spouses, which is where I took a lot of my um, thought process and, and that factual information from, even though that's what I already thought. Um, but anyway, guys, so check that out and we will be back tomorrow. Uh, we'll do, do a true crime tidbit. We're going to have Amanda back on. I know she used to be part of the team. She's rejoined us and she's going to be helping me talk about um, the psychological profile of moms who kill. Um, it's one of the subjects that we talk a lot about here. So have a good one. Alrighty. Bye guys. Have a good one. Serving up true crime one dish at a time from the good wives. Bye.